Okay. Brilliant. We're live, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on the very first Asia for Animals SMAC, so Social Media Animal Coalition webinar. I am going to share my screen to introduce our speakers and to set the scene on social media animal cruelty. Let me just hide all the things you don't need to see. Lovely. Okay. So to start, my name is Nicola O'Brien. I'm the lead coordinator of SMAC and I am supported in the team by uh, with Lauren, our other SMAC coordinator, who is here behind the scenes. And I might do a little intro to her later on in the talk. We are, of course, supported by our wonderful AFA team and our incredible volunteers, over 50 of them now, who assist us in our work. And I think we've got some of them in the call today. So I hope that you can just say a little hello in the chat so people know who you are and maybe share some comments about volunteering for SMAC. As we've just said, we are live on Zoom and YouTube. So let's keep all the comments friendly and polite. For those of us on Zoom, just a bit of housekeeping. Can you please make sure that your camera is off and remains off throughout the presentations and that your audio is muted so that we don't get any interruptions? Also, for those on Zoom, please can you change your name to match the one that you registered with so we can see who was able to join us today. And also when we're calling out your questions at the end that we can address you appropriately. Questions can be entered throughout the presentations in the chat box on either Zoom or YouTube, and our colleagues will be collecting them and I'll be reading those out for our panel in the last 15 minutes of the presentations. So before we get stuck in, just want to explain a little bit about who Asia for Animals is because not everyone will be aware of who we are. So Asia for Animals is one of the largest, if not the largest network of organizations working for animals in Asia, improving their welfare, their protection, and generally creating a better world for animals in Asia. We have over 250 member network, network member organizations, and we have 24 core member organizations of who you can see the logos here on the screen. And we have all kinds of organizations, big and small, with one shared goal. As Asia for Animals, we exist to bring those organizations together to complement each other's work, to make us more effective and efficient in our work for animals. And we have our shared goal of being a united voice for animals. We want to bring organizations together and facilitate collaboration between them by sharing resources, knowledge, and experience. We also are, um, provide networking for our members and want to be a central point of contact. So if there's anyone wanting to work on, sorry, something's popped up on the screen. Um, anyone that wants to work in animal welfare and is interested in what we do, there's lots of resources on our website around our network. So how does SMAC Social Media Animal Cruelty Coalition fit into this. We have a host of working groups that exist within Asia for Animals, and this is where we have brought together organisations working on key issues. So we have a macaque coalition, which focuses predominantly on issues affecting macaque species. We also have the Farmed Animal Coalition. We have an Ethical Elephant Coalition, Sanctuaries and Rescue Centres, who very recently did a fantastic event. We also have a new coalition, Dog and Cats, focusing on issues with those animals. And we have a growing capacity in animal protection group who hope to offer even more resources and support for organisations. But then, of course, we have the Social Media Animal Cruelty Coalition, or SMAC, as we call ourselves. And SMAC is made up of 19 member organisations, who you can see here, and they all have the shared goal of 
seeing animal cruelty content prohibited on social media. Some of those organisations are represented in our webinar today. They are all SMAC members, so I'm really pleased to introduce you to them all. First up, we have Jackie Bennett, who is the Programme Director of Africa and Asia of the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries. Jackie supports sanctuaries and rescue wildlife centres in those regions, and GFAS's mission is to accredit and recognise sanctuaries and rescue centres, support them to achieve the highest standards of excellence, promote collaboration and raise awareness of their work. She's also designed and overseen several workshops and other educational programs for sanctuaries. A former practicing attorney, she resides in the Washington DC area in the US. And today, Jackie's going to be talking to us about the depiction of wild animals as pets on social media. Following Jackie, we have Devon Shaw from Born Free USA. Devon is a campaigns associate and with Born Free, who fights against the exploitation of wild animals in captivity. Before achieving her MSc in primate conservation in 2019 at the Oxford Brooks University, she worked for several years as a primate caregiver and veterinary assistant at the Born Free USA Primate Sanctuary in South Texas. In her current position, she researches and writes reports on target issues, including the private trade of wild animals, wild animals in captivity, the effects of social media on wild animals, the fur trade and trapping. And today, Devon's going to be talking to us about primates as pets on social media. Next up, we have Emily Rapp, campaign manager from Lady Freethinker. Lady Freethinker is an organisation that works to expose and stop animal cruelty through investigative reporting and other media, citizen positions and partnerships with rescuers and activists on the ground worldwide. Emily studied environmental science at the University of North Carolina and started off her animal rights career by travelling the United States to educate students and others about different animal rights issues. In her current position, she helps develop and manage a wide range of projects to support Lady Freethinkers campaigns, including coordinating demonstrations and other actions to support LF Lady Freethinkers investigations. She also works to track social media cruelty to help push platforms to do more to stop cruelty content from being posted. And finally, we have Connie Cheng from the Taiwan SPCA. Connie is was born in Taiwan, but grew up in Vancouver, Canada. After graduating with a communications degree from Simon Fraser University, she moved back to Taiwan and founded the Taiwan SPCA in 2009. Connie's currently the executive director and leads the organization in helping animals by focusing on cruelty investigations, advocacy campaigns, and animal welfare education. And today, Connie will be talking to us about work on the ground to deal and tackle with content producers. Before we go into the detail, I do want to share a warning that some of the images and topics addressed in this webinar can be distressing. We haven't used the most violent or graphic images by any means, but of course, we are talking about animal suffering. So I'm going to start by setting the scene and discussing with you all what exactly is social media animal cruelty content? We class animal cruelty content as anything that has been posted on a social media platform by an individual organization or business that depicts animal cruelty or suffering for any reason apart from valid campaigning, journalistic or educational purposes. And this is really important because there needs to be that space for genuine animal advocates to be able to raise awareness on these issues. Anything else beyond that is purely content creators wanting to promote their own content and unfortunately allowing animals to suffer in the process. Looking more closely around what animal cruelty is itself, this is really important. So we define this as a range of human behaviours performed intentionally or unintentionally that cause animals harm or suffering, which may be immediate or long-term, physical or psychological. And there's some really key words in here that I want to emphasize. 
There is content out there where the cruelty may be physical, it may be violent, and it may be intentional, and it may be easier, should be easier to identify. But so much of the content that we are tackling actually includes content that might be having deep psychological impacts on animals. And it is long term suffering that's really important. And it's looking at what goes on beyond that maybe one minute video that we watch, really thinking about what experience the animal has had and is continuing to have. So I want to put a question to you all. You can join in on YouTube, but on Zoom, we also we have a poll that's going to pop up. And I want to know if you have ever seen animal cruelty content on social media. Just yes, no, or if you're not sure what you've seen, you can pop that in there as well, with real interest around what you might have come across. So at the moment, everyone on Zoom has said that they have seen animal cruelty content. which is really, it's really shocking, but it's also unfortunately a reflection on this issue and where we are at today and why we need to take action against it, that it's clearly very easy to come across this type of content. It's also in line with the kinds of comments that our member organisations receive from members of the public who get in touch with them and say things like this. I saw a video of a baby monkey being punished by its owner. I saw a video of a kitten being crushed. I saw a video of a dog set on fire and they're asking for help. Now, I would think that everyone on this call and hopefully the general public, if they saw this type of footage, they would know that that was animal cruelty straight away. But as I said, there are other forms of animal cruelty that might not be as obvious to the person who may not know much about animal behaviour or animal welfare or because you can't see the bigger picture beyond that. 30 second, one minute video. At SMAC, we have come up with a series of themes and specific abuses based on the data that we collect. And as you can see, unfortunately, there are a great deal of cruelty in this list that is violent abuse of animals. But there's also other forms in there, such as the use of animals as entertainers, psychological torture inflicted on animals, fake rescue of animals, sales of wild animals, using animals as performers and the wild animals as pets. And it's really these issues that we want to talk about in more depth today. To set the scene, I have pulled together a few images from these themes, but our panel will be getting into more detail. So wild animals as pets, these are the kinds of pictures that you can expect to see on social media, where it really normalises the keeping of wild animals as pets and shows that Pretty much any animal can be kept as a pet. Mates as pets. Primates feature in such a high proportion of the content that we find, and often they are dressed up, made to perform behaviours, and look as though they're little mini humans. Fake rescue. So uh, Emily's going to go into more detail about this today, and this is where animals are being put in dangerous situations where they're in need of rescue and it's being filmed for social media. Teasing as torture. We wrote a whole report on this and this is a form of content that is often shared as being amusing to watch or cute to see the animal's response. But in reality, animals are being scared, being put in stressful situations. In this bottom photo, the monkey has the food is being withheld from them and it's all teasing which is psychologically damaging. You are distressing animals intentionally for cruelty content. Psychological torture is of course so important and this can manifest itself in ways that are potentially more clear. So when animals are being disciplined in content, but also we see a lot of footage where animals are being bathed or made to wear clothes or being deprived of others of their own kind. And all of that has a psychological impact on these animals. So I'm now going to hand over to our first speaker, Jackie, who's going to talk more about the use of wild animals as pets in social media content. Thank you, Nicola. I'm just going to share my screen. Get started. 
So I'm just going to give a brief overview of the issue of wild animals as pets, why this is a matter of animal cruelty, and social media pets. We can all agree if we see an image on social media of someone physically abusing an animal, such as hitting the animal, that that is cruelty. But sometimes it is less obvious. And let's look at this photo of two slow lorises. There's no human in the picture. No one is seen hitting the animal. And your first reaction might be something like, oh, look how cute they are. But when you see images like this on social media, you're seeing some very deliberate content, some curated content, and you're not seeing what cruelty may be behind the scenes, cruelty that brought the animals to this moment that may at first glance seem harmless or, or fun. And we'll take a look at this photo in a few minutes. In fact, SMAC's, um, in SMAC's analysis of cruelty and abuses, looking at over 1,700 social media links, by far the most common theme and type of depiction was that of wild animals as pets. And when we talk about wild pets, we're talking about species kept in domestic settings, even though they're not domesticated animals like dogs and cats. Those species have evolved over thousands of years to be the domesticated species they are today. By contrast, wild animals like primates or big cats or reptiles will have natural instincts and behaviors adapted to live in natural environments. And this is true even if a particular wild animal is captive for them. For this reason, we talk about animal growth, so even for those wild animals, they have good intentions. And these individuals may not realize the human cause. As just mentioned, wild animals don't belong in homes. They are not domesticated. And owners are not able to address their needs. They're often ignorant of the species specific natural behaviors, diet, and social needs. And this results in poor care. Also, by sharing images of their so-called pets on social media, Perhaps in pictures or videos of wild animals being treated like human children, the owners may not realize that they are contributing to the erroneous perception that keeping them is And so we talk about the vicious cycle and the role that social media plays in it. Wild animals are transported in the pet trade. They become owned as pets. Their images are shared on social media. People see these images and comment and say they want a wild animal of their own. This increases the demand, <clears throat> excuse me, increases the demand for more animals in the illegal wildlife trade. And you can start this analysis at any point in the cycle as each step will fuel the next one and it continues on and on. And I'm going to start with talking about the wild animal trade. This is a big business generating billions of dollars annually. It is also a very cruel business. Often it is the young animals being captured, ripped from their families who were likely killed to get to that baby animal. Species may be bred for the pet trade and are often bred and held in very poor conditions where crowding and lack of hygiene will foster disease transmission and fighting and aggression between animals. Many animals die in transit for reasons including starvation, temperature change, or simply the stress of transport. Social media plays a role here as well, as wildlife traffickers claiming to be dealers or pet breeders will advertise their animals for sale online. And when they're contacted by a potential buyer, they can instruct them to communicate through private messaging on channels like WhatsApp or Snapchat which where the messages are encrypted and hidden from law enforcement. And unfortunately, the COVID pandemic was a boon to these wildlife traffickers with more activities moving online and therefore making it more difficult to determine where those traffickers are. The impact of the wild pet trade by looking, for example, at tigers. Now, we don't have an exact number of tigers that are left in the wild, but estimates go from anywhere between around 3,500 to maybe 5,000. 
Uh, regardless of that exact number, it's clearly dwarfed by the number of turquoise. Did I lose my screen share? Yes, I think you did. Can you try again? There we go. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Thank um, you. But that number is dwarfed by the number of tigers in captivity, uh, kept as pets in homes or in other facilities that will foster the perception that these are domesticated animals that can be handled as pets. And tigers are high dollar pets in the trade. People own them for any number of reasons. It may be what we have referred to as the ignorant owner, thinking they're helping an animal, but not really equipped to meet the tiger's needs. It may be a collector, someone who wants a tiger as a status symbol. It may be someone who intentionally abuses animals for entertainment and profit. But the impact of wild pet ownership is far reaching. Capturing animals for the pet trade, and these are often endangered species we're talking about, will deplete the wild populations. Zoonotic disease transmission becomes a big risk. With an estimated 75% of emerging infectious diseases in humans being transmitted from wildlife. And then there's the safety issue. Wild animals can bite, they scratch, they kill, they escape. And sadly, many wild pets are often eventually abandoned, released, confiscated by authorities, or surrendered to rescue centers and sanctuaries. And I can tell you that we at Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries hear these stories again and again. Animals such as those in these headlines, uh, the lion found as a pet in France, who is now at a sanctuary in South Africa, or the tiger found wandering a neighborhood, now safely in a sanctuary in Texas. They may be considered the lucky ones as they did land in sanctuaries and they will get lifetime care. But of course, this care requires a lot of funding and other resources, and of course, a lot of expertise. And while these facilities strive to give life of species appropriate care and companionship, no one can fully give these animals back the life that they have in their natural wild setting. Another step in that vicious cycle and while the owners are sharing evidence on their social media channels of their pets in domestic situations can normalize the situation. And studies have shown that this type of depiction of close contact with wildlife, or even standing in the proximity of wildlife, can foster a perception that it's fine to own a wild animal and it can inspire others to get an animal of their own. We so often see celebrities and other influencers sharing photos on their social media accounts, posing with their wild pets, and these celebrities are people who project an image of success, of beauty, of glamour, and a great life, and they have a large social media followings of fans who want to be just like them. On social media, you will rarely see the negative side of, of wild pet ownership, the biting or other aggressive behavior that's very often defensive behavior. People will comment on social media posts, often how cute the animal is or asking how they can get one. And these kinds of videos can go viral very quickly. One video of a pet slow loris generated more than 9 million views before it was removed, racking up hundreds of comments expressing how cute the slow loris was and saying that they wanted one. And so why should we be concerned about the cruelty here? Well, we know about slow lorises' natural behavior. In the wild, they are nocturnal animals. They sleep during the day. They are not awake in the day and night. They'll travel great distances at night, and they have a complex diet. When they're captured by wildlife traffickers, they'll likely be crammed together in small and poorly ventilated containers. Their teeth will be cut out using nail clippers or wire cutters without any anesthetic to numb the pain, and this leaves them defenseless. For those who survive these steps in the vicious cycle, they'll be kept as pets and eventually forced to be awake during the day when their owners are awake. Unable to travel the distances they would in the wild, 
quickly without the diet and other care that they need. See these two slurses in this picture, and in right way, you can understand the cruelty, and there's nothing to do about that. So when we see images on social media of the book that we had, most of the things they could do is just not be I right, check your time's up. Say so everything I presented is in our spotlight. So turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Jackie. So now I'm going to hand over to Devon from Born Free USA, who's going to talk to us specifically about primates as pets on social media. Hey everyone, thanks Nicola for the introduction. All right, I'll go ahead and get to my presentation here. All right, so my slide should be up there for everybody to see. Um, so again, my name is Devin. Um, I'm from Born Free USA. I'm a campaigns associate currently, uh, and I will be going into a little more detail about primates as pets. So first, um, at Born Free USA, some of our main um, goals, uh, we oppose the exploitation of wildlife or wild animals in captivity and work to keep them where they belong, which is in the wild. So main campaigns that um, we work on include the wildlife trade, wild in captivity, trapping, the fur trade, and coexisting with wildlife. Um, we operate one of the largest primate sanctuaries here in the U.S., which is located in South Texas on um, just about 200 acres, and um, we rescue primates from traumatic situations, including the pet trade uh, from biomedical research labs and also from zoos. Um, so to get into the roadmap for my presentation today, we're um, going to get into the U.S. legislation pertaining to primates as pets, uh, the dangers of keeping primates as pets, pets um, primates on social media, of course, um, impacts on animal welfare. And uh, I also have some case studies from our sanctuary that I was involved directly um, as I spent some time working as caregiver at the primate sanctuary as well. And um, global implications of the private primate trade. And then of course, how people can help. So some relevant work that we've produced at Born Free that I just want to flag. Um, in 2021, we came out with a report called, called Public Danger, Private Pain, um, which discussed uh, the legislation in some more detail throughout the U.S. and the implications of the private trade um, around the U.S. And then we have a documentary called Finding Sanctuary, Life After the Primate Pet Trade. And then in 2022, which I'll point to this um, study a bit later in the presentation, we came out with a study called Their Lives for Your Likes, and that focused on the exploitation of wild animals in social media. So uh, just some background about legislation within the United States. So in May of 2021, the Captive Primate Safety Act was introduced to the United States Congress, um, and it is expected to be introduced again to Congress this year. If passed, this legislation would ban the keeping of non-human primates and most public interaction with primates in zoos and other entertainment venues. Um, it was introduced on the grounds of public safety, uh, while animal welfare is of course important, um, the public safety angle uh, was um, a strategy that was employed to um, point to the dangers to the human public of keeping primates in captivity, which I'll get into more detail about that later. And um, implementation of the Captive Primate Safety Act is essential to end the dangerous and cruel US pet trade and to protect future generations of both human and non-human primates from harm. So it's a really important piece of legislation to get passed here. Um, so the dangers, experts agree that there's really no way for primates to be kept safely and in a way that does not significantly harm them in captivity, both physically and psychologically. This is mostly because, as Jackie and Nicola already mentioned, primates are not domesticated. Even when they're bred for multiple generations in captivity, they still are not domesticated like dogs and cats are, who have co-evolved with people for several thousands of years. Um, Breeder and distributor advertisements for primates online often feature inaccurate and misleading descriptor words, including tame, gentle, and sweet to sell these animals, 
or promote their interaction experiences, which may apply to the infants, but not as these animals mature and um, act more on their wild instincts, which will always inevitably happen once they reach a certain age around sexual maturity. Um, so the severe stress levels they experience in captivity often heighten these aggressive and unpredictable tendencies, which again make interactions with these wild animals increasingly more dangerous. Um, so irrespective of the circumstances, primates will always react in an unpredictable and aggressive manner in captivity. So it doesn't matter about what species they are, how old they are, uh, whether or not they've been habituated to humans throughout their lifetimes, or if the humans working with them have extensive husbandry experience with them. So if they're zookeepers, veterinarians, all of these people uh, from all different backgrounds have reported dangerous encounters like escapes and attacks uh, from primates. So um, first responders like firefighters, paramedics, police officers, and animal control officers are not trained to deal with primates or any other dangerous wild animals when escapes or attacks occur. So that is another layer of this that makes owning these animals in um, private possession especially dangerous. Um, dangerous animals are often shot dead as a result if an escape or attack occurs that can't be safely contained. Um, tranquilizing is too unpredictable and too time consuming. So in these situations, the public safety of the humans is always prioritized over the safety of the animals. Um, so the animals often die as a result for something that's not even their fault, which is really unfortunate. Um, and importantly, trained primates, including service animals, have also been involved in these attacks of a wide range of species. So uh, it's, it's really important to note um, things like that as well. So non-human primates can transmit more than 200 known diseases to humans, many of which can be fatal, including, including herpes B, Ebola, and SARS. And then it also occurs in the opposite direction. So humans uh, can transmit diseases to primates, which include herpes, intestinal parasites, and measles. Um, herpes B is actually carried asymptomatically by most macaques. So um, untreated in humans, herpes B is fatal in up to 80% of cases. There is no vaccine for herpes B if it's contracted by a human. Um, so that's very dangerous. The severity of zoonotic disease transmission has been underscored by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, which we've all experienced. And despite these risks, um, wildlife safaris, zoos, animal rental agencies, and exotic petting zoos throughout the country and the world actively encourage people to have direct physical interactions with primates on a regular basis. So that's also very problematic. Um, so primates on social media, uh, this content often depicts unrealistically positive interactions between primates and humans. Um, and this content perpetuates the false narratives that one, primates are safe to be kept as pets, and two, primate populations are stable in the wild, um, both of which are not true. And uh, seeing this content also normalizes the private keeping of primates. Uh, and these inaccurate perceptions that many viewers adopt after viewing such content has been linked to increases in the demand for exotic pets. So it's just a really vicious, uh, endless cycle. So um, our report that we published in the fall of 2022 called Their Lives for Your Likes, um, we analyzed 50 YouTube videos for five of the most popular exotic pets in the US at that time. So that included pythons, wolf dogs, tigers, marmosets, and gray parrots. And of course, marmosets were our primate example for this group. Uh, so overall, the, the, the videos depicting exotic pets comprise most of our data set at 65% of all the videos followed by wild animals at 15%, animals in zoos or captive wildlife parks at 13%, and animals in quote sanctuaries at 8%. And I have sanctuaries in quotes because um, not all of these sanctuaries were accredited um, or legitimate in the way that Born Free would recognize or GFAS would recognize. Uh, a lot of them were self-proclaimed sanctuaries that did not appear to be legitimate. Um, so marmosets demonstrated the highest number of pet videos out of all of the animals at 90% of all the videos of marmosets that we saw featuring a pet. Um, direct physical interaction with humans appeared in 100% of all these marmoset videos, uh, again, very problematic. And one third of all marmoset videos provided a link to actually purchase these animals through an exotic animal breeder. So it made it all the more easy for viewers to head down that path if it was something they were interested in. So these are just examples of what we saw um, from that data collection on YouTube. So going from the left to right, 
uh, there is um, a screenshot of a video of a uh, young marmoset pet owner um, showing his interactions with his pet marmoset. Um, second to that is a screenshot of a video that actually linked to an exotic animal breeder. So you could purchase one just as easily as that. Um, and then the second two are also images of pet marmosets and infants um, separated from their mothers way too early um, and interacting with humans. So this is SMAC data um, that points to just how prevalent this issue is with primates specifically compared to other wild animal species. So um, you can see on the right that primates outnumber the other species by thousands um, when it comes to seeing problematic videos of them online. Um, and then on the left is a breakdown of the individual primate species that are featured most frequently. So um, macaques are very common. And so impacts on animal welfare, it's impossible to create an environment for primates that fully meet all of their physical and behavioral needs. Um, they suffer extreme isolation and social deprivation from other primates throughout their lives. Um, as a result of this isolation, they, they develop abnormal repetitive behaviors that often resemble PTSD symptoms like hypervigilance, aggressive outbursts, excessive fears, and self-directed behaviors like self-biting, hitting themselves, et cetera. Um, as they become older, they become more predict unpredictable and stronger, which often elicits a fearful response from the owners, which then turns into neglect. Uh, so they uh, receive a lack in medical care. They often endure painful physical complications because most owners either don't recognize these things in primates or they simply can't find a vet to treat them. So case studies from our sanctuary, we have Lila at the top. That's the cage that she was kept in for seven years of her life. Nothing was in the cage except a scrap of blue fabric that she hid behind when we rescued her. She's now at the sanctuary thriving in a much larger enclosure with access to other monkeys, which is amazing. And then Gambit on the bottom there, we rescued him two years ago from Las Vegas in a similar situation. He spent four years of his life in a bird cage that was just the same dimension with dimension as Lila's cage, but a couple feet higher. And all he had in there with him was that stick. Um, and the, the uh, photo on the right is him thriving at the sanctuary. So both have happy endings, but unfortunately that's not the case for most of these um, pet monkeys. So uh, the private ownership trade accounts for one of the top three most destructive factors driving primate species toward extinction. So it's extremely problematic. Um, while countries like the US allow this, the legal trade will mask any illegal trade that occurs. Um, so making the trade altogether it will be massive, uh, a massive um, undertaking to regulate and control as long as these things stay legal and allowed. Um, in endemic countries that can release rehabilitated primates back into the wild, any diseases transmitted from humans to the primates could impact the population status of wild groups. And then the capture of wild monkeys often results in the killing of more members of their troop, like their mothers um, or relatives. So solutions, we can ensure uh, the passage of legislation like the Captive Primate Safety Act in the US and other parts of the world. We can work with social media platforms to help identify and remove content that harms primates. We can adapt artificial intelligence symptoms that can identify threatened species. And uh, we can link this function to a notification that overviews a particular species conservation oh, sex. Oh, sorry, guys, I went over. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. That was the end. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Thank you so much, Darren. That was good. And it's really lovely to actually see some stories, some happy stories um, of what, you know, some of the animals that can make it out of this trade and, and to happiness, hopefully. Right, okay, now we're gonna pass over to Emily, who's going to talk about fake rescues. Great, thanks so much for the introduction, Nicola. Um, I'll just share my screen here. Um, let's get this out of the way. Okay. Um, so again, my name's Emily. I'm a campaign manager at Lady Freethinker, and today I'll be talking about fake rescues. Um, what are they and how do you identify them? 
So what are fake rescue videos? Fake rescue videos are videos that intentionally place animals in dangerous situations for social media views, subscribers, and revenue. Typically at the end of the video, the rescuer rushes in to save the distressed animal. People who post the videos earn a profit if their channel is monetized, which may be substantial when a video goes viral. And also they often ask people to donate in their videos or they'll include links to their PayPal accounts. So at Lady Freethinker, we work to track and log fake rescue videos across social media platforms like YouTube and Facebook, where we have found it's the most prevalent. And also the SMAP Coalition does this too and collects data from other organizations like Lady Freethinker for a centralized database. So what are the different types of these fake rescue videos? So there are two main types, the first being staged animal attacks where the prey animal is rescued in the end. So this could be a cat who's placed somewhere with a python and then like the filmmaker will come out and rescue the cats in the end. Um, and then the other kind of fake rescue video are animals who are placed in precarious situations. So in staged animal attacks, um, like I was saying, the filmmakers typically put animals like kittens, puppies, chickens, or any other animal into a man-made cave or another location with a pet python or maybe a lizard or an eagle or some other sort of predatory animal. And will either allow the predator to attack or they will wrap the python around the victim. And just a note here that staged animal attacks don't that don't involve rescues employ similar tactics, but there, there's no human rescuer, so they wouldn't be fake rescue videos. So an example of that is a cat who might be forced off, forced to fend off a python. Um, so here's just two examples um, that we included here. On the right, you can see a cat and her kittens um, in one of those man-made caves I mentioned with a python um, you know, coming at them. And then on the right, we have a puppy, really sad image um, of a python wrapped around his or her body. So for these videos, um, the victim, so the dogs and cats in these situations and the python are both put in dangerous situations since these animals are also trying to defend themselves so they could injure the snake. So it's bad for, bad for all of the animals involved. So the other type of fake rescue videos, um, animals put in dangerous situations. So this could include animals who are put somewhere like maybe on train tracks, which is terrible. Um, animals with their legs tied together um, to be left in places only to be found by these filmmakers, or maybe they're put in like fast flowing rivers and streams, um, things like that. And then the, re the res rescue would be filmed. Um, so here's two examples of, of this type of video. Um, for these, um, the screenshots that these videos came from were actually taken down on Facebook recently, which is great. Um, but you can see here, like, this poor puppy on the left is tied with rope and has um, another thing tied around his or her, like, snout. And then this dog on the right is just, like, taped up, but looks like he or she's in the middle of the street. So things like this. It's also like the likelihood of someone stumbling upon this is just like, it's very obviously a staged rescue, like fake rescue. Um, so how to identify these? So the first way to identify these is sometimes the videos are filmed cinematically with like perfect cutscenes and timing to make the content creators appear as heroes. So you can see in this video, like the kitten was um, on train tracks in the beginning, and then it cuts to this person's like on his way home from work, and he took a different way than he usually does and stumbled upon this kitten. So things that make it seem like a movie or to make it like people want to watch it, that's a huge red flag. Number two is the page has a trend of videos showing them rescuing these animals from terrible and unusual situations, or they maybe have a PayPal in their bio or asks for donations. So you can see on the right, these are just like a bunch of videos from this one profile um, that just showed these animals in really unusual situations. Um, and they're all posted pretty shortly after one another. And then here on the left, you can see in this video, this person asked to like, share, subscribe, 
Um, that's how they make their money. So that's a red flag. And then also just having a link to the PayPal, um, like here you can see there's really no, if there's no real like identifying info, like here they just have a, their name of the channel and like the location. If this was a real rescue, they'd have way more info, like, you know, the actual location, um, websites, contact information, things like that. But in this situation, they just have this PayPal linked with no real identifying info. So another red flag is you notice the video was posted on several, uh, several different pages, or maybe the same animals are being rescued multiple times, or the videos are posted close together. So sometimes you'll see a video posted, like the same video that's posted on one Facebook um, channel, and then maybe it's on another Facebook channel, or maybe you also see it on YouTube under a different name. So that would be a huge red flag um, that it's a fake rescue video. And also, a lot of the times you'll notice that the same animals are being rescued. So here we have this poor puppy who was wrapped in plastic, um, video posted on December 28th, and less than two weeks later, here, here she is hanging from a tree in a plastic bag. So here we can see it's that's the same dog. Um, same thing below. This little puppy is tied in rope, February 25th. And then just one day later, here, here she is in a plastic bag. So that's a huge red flag too, that these aren't, you know, real rescue videos. Number five is animals who are rescued appear to be injured, lethargic, drugged, or otherwise unwell. So the animals in the video may appear exhausted, really lethargic, or listless with distress. And fake rescue videos may present signs of physical injury or harm, such as cuts, wounds, or behaviors that suggest the animal is stressed or in fear. So in this specific video, this monkey they said was rescued, um, he or she has like cuts all over their face. And in this video, this monkey was clearly in distress and very fearful. So that's huge, huge red flag. And then just by the numbers, just to show you that these videos do, they do go viral. Um, so like this one, this monkey on the top left, this monkey was being, was really fearful um, and someone was feeding them from a bottle. So 18 million views. And then below that, this monkey was wrapped in fishing net intentionally, um, 13 million views, a dog and tar, 10 million. And then this chicken who was placed with a python at 6 million. So they get a lot of views, unfortunately. And um, at Lady Free Thinker, right now in our database, we have over 150 fake rescue videos from YouTube and Facebook logged that are still active. This number is always changing because sometimes they'll be taken down, like that one Facebook um, uh, channel I mentioned earlier with those sad puppy screenshots that was taken down. Um, and then we're also always adding new ones that we find, so that number is always changing. So Nicole is gonna go into this more. So just briefly, you can report what you can do to stop it. You can report videos on the platform. You can also report them to Smack and you can alert advertisers if you see their company's ads on videos promoting animal cruelty. And also don't share or interact with the videos and ask others to do the same. And that's everything. Okay, thank you, Emily. Just to say to everyone, obviously there were quite a few images in there that were not nice to see. So we're sorry that that's included as part of this topic. Okay, so our final speaker is Connie from Taiwan SPCA, who's going to be talking to us about work on the ground, tackling this kind of content and those that are creating it. Thanks, Connie. Hi everyone, I'm um, going to share my presentation. Okay, um, so just a brief introduction. Um, Taiwan is an island with a population of about 24 million people. Um, Taiwan SPCA we were founded in 2009. Uh, we currently only have 15 full staff, including seven inspectors who deal with animal cruelty reports that we receive from the public. Um, as an NGO, we don't have um, legal rights to enforce the law, but we do work with the central government and local government authorities. And on average, oops, 
Um, on average, we receive about five to 600 um, reports each year, um, mainly involving um, the improper rearing of animals, um, such as failure to provide, you know, water, food, shelter, environment, et cetera. Um, cases that involve uh, physical harm, such as beating or causing injuries, out of the cases reported to us is only around 6%. We also receive a variety of other complaints, such as um, the Ill illegal pet um, trade or abandonment, um, the use of traps, et cetera. Okay, um, in regards to online cruelty, I will be sharing three case examples um, if I have time um, and explain how we deal with these cases um, in Taiwan and especially the challenges that we face currently. Okay, so a brief explanation of our Animal Protection Act. Let me just do this. Okay, so there are three situations where there will be considered a criminal offense. And these are situations where the police have to get involved. So Article 25 is some if deliberately kills or harms an animal. Um, Article 25-1, if multiple animals are killed using uh, poison, firearm. Article 27-1, um, the dissemination of media content that shows the abuse or killing of animals. So for certain online content, the police does and should get involved. So my first case example, um, this is a recent case that was reported to us um, from some people in North America. Um, someone had come across a TikTok uh, it was live stream video where an adult female dog and some puppies were trapped and um, seemingly abused and, you know, stuck in a van. And according to um, the reporters, um, one to two puppies and maybe an adult dog may have died already. And the informant claimed that some people looked at some of the um, images and thinks that the dogs are in Taiwan. Okay. So with cases like this obviously we have to try to determine where the action is taking place which country which city um but it's not um always very easy to do so um, because many times the information provided can be um you know there's a lot of information sometimes it can be quite confusing and um, sometimes also not very accurate so with this case first we checked the TikTok account um shown on on the picture and we found that indeed it is um, it is a Taiwanese user and from the account um, we were able to find a local phone number that confirmed this user is Taiwanese okay so, however as we looked into this further we found that this account was actually somehow cross posting the content or or this person was sharing this live stream and actually our inspector made a phone call to the local number um, and the person picked up, um, and fr but from the conversation, you know, he was very, he sounded very convincing that really he didn't know what was going on. He didn't know he was sharing this, this video. And, you know, during the call, he was even asking his family members in the background, you know, does anybody know about this, who shared this? Um, but, you know, we, we, he sounded convincing and we had no further evidence to really pin this on him. Um, so then we went on to the source account, the primary account, and from one post, we found a delivery box, which you see in the central, the central image, to the corner background of this live video, and we were able to confirm that this was happening somewhere in China, because the courier service, the this letter, um, these are actually uh, simplified Chinese characters, and we use traditional Chinese characters in Taiwan. So at the end, there was not much we could do from our end um, in Taiwan. Um, our, my second case example, okay, this was a case we received in 2022 um, regarding a video of someone eating a dog. Uh, this was posted to someone's IG stories, but, um, you know, even though the person who posted this video, he was actually slamming this act, but because he uploaded um, the video directly from his account and not from sharing um, someone else's video, we, you know, we thought that he, he probably knows more about the source or perhaps he is the perpetrator. Um, the only thing we could do was we DM'd him, um, but received no reply. 
So then we, re we reported this to the local police in Taiwan, but they actually replied to us that there was nothing the police could do unless we know where the person's located because IG, which is uh, owned by Meta, um, Meta does not cooperate with law enforcement um, on animal cruelty content, meaning they don't provide um, account or user information to the police. Um, so then with this case, I actually had to go and ask an acquaintance of mine who worked at uh, the cyber crimes unit at the criminal police department. And he seems to think that this video was uploaded from Korea. Okay, yeah, a lot of information. Um, but again, this IG story only had trad traditional Chinese characters on it, no Korean. So I asked um, asked him, you know, how, how did he know that this was from Korea? Um, and he didn't reply. Um, and later he switched units. So I did not get a clear answer. Um, and now he's MIA. Um, and now the account is set to private. So again, this was a case that um, we can do anything about. So um, we've asked the police, we've asked the Central Animal um, Protection Authority, the County of Agriculture, and they've all told us that um, they are also having um, facing a hard time getting Meta, uh, who owns Facebook and IG, to provide account information and IP locations, um, because Meta policy is that they only provide information for cases involving eight type eight types of criminal um, crime, which does not include animal abuse and cruelty. Um, you can see the eight types um, in this document. So really in Taiwan, it seems a problem is really only with Meta because other social media platforms seem to cooperate much better um, with the police, at least in Taiwan. Um, so really the only thing we could do right now is if the content is shared on Facebook or IG is to try to find out information ourselves, which is very difficult. Um, we've only had one successful case in 2017. Uh, someone posted a video of him hanging his uh, pet lizard uh, by a rope and uh, the animal was seen struggling because uh, this was reported by this guy's friend. Um, so there was a su successful charge because we knew who the person was. Um, the only second thing we could do is try to report to Meta to take down the content, but Meta doesn't always do so. And it's also very easy to set up new accounts. Okay, my final case study involves um, the keeping of macaques as pets. Um, along with other animal protection groups, we conducted a three-year study um, and collected 127 cases of macaques being privately kept by members of the public. Um, you know, we suspected that the keeping of macaques would increase when Taiwan downgraded the uh, protection status of the animals. Um, and indeed, that is what happened. Uh, we found that people started to post their um, uh, you know, pet macaques online to show off, to, to get attention. Um, you know, someone was reported by the news um, walking their macaque on the streets um, in Taiwan. There were also businesses um, who started posting photos of their pet macaques on their fan pages, uh, probably to attract attention and business. So again, this sort of behavior does normalize the keeping of wildlife and people are misled to think that it's legal to do so, which is not true. Okay, so um, we used 100, 127 cases, we compiled a report, uh, we had to have a press conference, and we asked the government to ban the keeping of macaques by law. And the good news is, uh, the government listened, and now it is illegal to do so in Taiwan. But um, out of the 127 cases, some animals ended up being sent to private zoos, because the government uh, sanctuaries are you know, they're all at full capacity. They don't take in uh, wild animals unless they are in protective status. Um, some of the macaques were just let go uh, by their owners before we could um, do anything about it. Some cities um, actually allowed some of the macaques to stay with their owners um, as the government had nowhere to seize and keep the animals. So, excuse me, um, it's not easy to do rescues, um, operating a sanctuary and taking care of animals. Um, that can live for a very long time. You know, it costs a lot of money, resources, and manpower, and they, the sanctuaries get full very quickly. So the real solution is always try to get to the root of the, root of the problem, and prevention is key. All right, very quickly, conclusion. Um, 
So, of course, we want to make sure people do not engage with these posts um, because that's exactly what the creators want, right? Um, and it normalizes the abuse of animals. Second, what we can do is report to these platforms, try to get the content taken down. This works sometimes, um, but other times content do not get removed, which is something Smack is trying to get the, um, the platforms to improve on. And then um, sometimes as NGO, we end up having to do the investigative work for the police, it seems. Uh, so we do try to find out uh, if we can, you know, where the person works at, where, where, where they go to school at, and provide evidence to law enforcement as it quickens the process. And then um, SMAC is also trying to build relationships with platforms, and, but we have to be very strategic, you know, because they could just choose not to communicate. Um, lastly, uh, I think this is very important, uh, trying to change legislation, amend the laws, but the process is very very long and very challenging, and we need public support. We need legislators to support our bills. Um, you know, we need government to take these situations seriously. It all takes a lot of time and communication. Um, but I want to end my presentation with uh, some good news uh, from Taiwan. The Council of Agriculture is in the midst of amending our Animal Protection Act uh, to include legal responsibilities for third par party platforms requiring requiring them by law to take down one ad pertaining to the illegal sale of dogs and cats online and second the sale of illegal traps such as gin traps and if the bill passes the law will also require telecom service providers to comply so um this is definitely a step in the right direction so some good news for uh, to share with you all thank you Thank you so much, Connie. That was some great news to share at the end. As you say, a step in the right direction against social, forcing social media companies to actually have to take some responsibility for their role in things. And that's what we're about to talk about. I'm going to talk to you about what exactly SMAC and our members are doing. On the wrong slide. Sorry about that. Okay, so one of the largest parts of our work as a coalition is focusing on the social media platforms because they are quite literally giving a platform to animal abusers and perhaps ignorant people who aren't who are intentionally hurting animals but want to put their content online. They are giving them a platform to do this and they're doing very little to actually monitor and restrict that responsibly. When we look at some of the major social media platforms, we do see that many have policies prohibiting animal cruelty, but this is mostly focused on physical violence. So it's not capturing so much of what we've discussed today in our presentations around that long term psychological suffering that animals endure. Very few of them have clear definitions of what actually actually constitutes as animal cruelty. So therefore most content is not being covered. They also have contradictory statements and exceptions. So for example, many of the platforms actually allow the filming of content that shows people eating live animals. And when we think that this is being created intentionally for social media, and it obviously involves suffering and the death of animals, it's really shocking that that is permitted. Some have dedicated reporting options so that you can flag this content to them, but it's often very hard to find them. Overall, enforcement is poor, although CAP, uh, SMAC has been working hard on seeing improvements in this. And we feel overall at the moment it is a low priority for platforms. One of the other major issues with social media cruelty content is the fact that it is now becoming profitable for abusers. We all know how social media works. There are influencers and content creators who can become really popular and basically make have a business and make money from using their social media accounts. And this is true of those sharing animal abuse content as well. So if their content is getting lots of engagement, has a certain number of subscribers, followers, views on their videos, then they may be eligible for advertising. And 
Lady Freethinker, who Emily presented from today, actually looked at around 2,000 videos showing animal cruelty content in 2020, and they found that these videos could be worth up to £15 million in advertising revenue, dollars, sorry. And for the YouTube themselves, it could be around $12 million. So there is real money to be made in this content. So I'm pleased to say that Smack has a relationship with some major social media platforms, including Meta, who run Instagram, WhatsApp and Facebook, TikTok and YouTube. And when we have the in our relationship, we're having conversations with the platforms, providing evidence to them. And what we're pushing for is policy changes. So we want to see their policies widen the scope of what they class as animal cruelty so that we can capture those other forms of cruelty. We ideally want there to be standardised definitions between the different social media platforms so that this prevents those that create the content simply moving from one channel to the other, from one platform, so from Facebook to TikTok, as they are prohibited on one but not on the other. So having joined up definitions would be the best outcome. We also want these platforms to use their incredible technology and their resources to improve their monitoring of this content so that it doesn't make it onto the platform in the first place. And if it does, that it's quickly detected and removed. And so SMAC has been carrying out some keyword research that we're sharing with the platforms, which enables them to find those terms that will systematically lead people to animal cruelty content. We've also offered to provide training on animal welfare issues to their policy department, but also to their moderators so they know how to identify animal cruelty. We want the platforms to improve reporting mechanisms so it's easier for us all to report content that we find. And for some of the platforms, we do now have escalation processes where we can get a quick response on content that we find that needs to be removed. Of course, I just talked to you about the monetization of animal cruelty content, and this is a huge issue, which is drawing people into this business of creating content. So we want to see that ended. Alongside all of this, of course, we also want some room for legitimate campaigning or educational content to be permitted, because it's really important that that is allowed to continue. I'm really pleased to say that our relationships are going well with the platforms. Some of them are quicker and more responsive than others. But TikTok in particular um, have just launched as of April the 21st, a new series of community guidelines with more detail around what they class as animal abuse and what is and isn't allowed on the platform. There is more we want to do here and our conversations are continuing with the platform, but it's really great to see that through conversations with SMAC and other animal organisations, it is leading to some change and the platforms are listening. So beyond our work with the platforms, we are of course a coalition of animal organisations and so we support our members in joint projects but they also are doing their own work on this in this area. So we aid our member organisations as best as we can and we want to be able to take to help them to take action locally, especially where content may be being created. So maybe some of the work that Connie talked about today. We want to bring together experts in animal protection, conservation, animal law and others to develop strategies and to be the most effective group that we can. We want to work with other organisations that are also focusing on issues on social media. So this could be organisations trying to tackle hate crimes online or um, child protection because they themselves are working with the platforms and trying to see policy change so we can learn from each other. Some of our members, again, as mentioned today, are working on legislation changes in their countries to see this content being prohibited. And actually, as we speak, there is a bill in the UK called the UK Online Safety Bill that is going through the parliamentary process right now. And that is seeking to put more onus on social media platforms to have to control content on their platform. It's mostly focused on protecting the viewers um, from harmful content. And we want to push for this to include animal cruelty content. And many of our members are working hard on that right now. 
Some of our members have also taken individual legal actions against platforms, and some of them carry out extensive research, which they have published in papers. So all of these are multi-pronged approach to seeing change for animals on these platforms. One of the main things that we do collectively as a coalition is we produce reports. And in 2021, we released the first report of its kind looking at this issue, which really did attract attention and surprise a lot of people, even those working within the animal welfare, animal protection world, who didn't realise the scale of this problem. And since then, we've produced a series of spotlight reports looking more deeply into these issues, which we've used um, to collect data, to identify the key problems. We use it in public awareness and, of course, in our conversations with the platforms themselves. Press and public awareness is so important and our members have been fantastic at getting some really great coverage for these reports worldwide, which again, there is great interest in this because people don't realise the scale of the problem. We also do a lot of outreach on social media and we really encourage you to follow us on all of our social media channels and to share this content as much as possible. Talking about what you can do to help animals. So SMAC has produced our five steps to stop online animal cruelty. First of all, is to be aware. And so by you being here in this webinar, you are learning, you are learning about the issue and about how to spot the content. To aid you in that further, we do have a series of videos on our website called Ask Yourself, and these in turn focus on different types of animal cruelty. There is no graphic content in any of the videos, but obviously some of it is quite sad to watch. So I've just chosen one as an example for you today. I think there might have been an issue with the sound I'm sorry if there is but hopefully that gives you an idea and they are on our website for you to find and have a look at so I'm just sharing here a few points of how questions you can ask yourself when you do see animal cruelty content and these questions here are about the animal shown so is this animal clearly suffering or in distress that's an obvious one but let's go a bit deeper so are they free in the wild or are they being held captive? And should they be in that situation? Are they being kept in species appropriate conditions? Are they having their social dietary behavioral needs met? And is that even possible in the situation that they're in? Can they leave the situation safely? And that's really important so they can get to safety. And particularly we see this in freight rescue that they can't. Does the animal seem to engage on natural behaviours? Are they rocking? Are they spinning from side to side? These are all signs of severe distress. And does the animal appear in multiple videos? Again, as pointed out by Emily in the fake rescue videos. And here's some questions we can ask about the content creator. Does the person seem knowledgeable and qualified about animal welfare? Is the page a legitimate animal rescue or sanctuary that you can actually trace online? Does the creator have many of the same types of videos? Again, as highlighted by Emily previously. Is it normal for the person to be interacting with a species and the animal in that way? And is there more information from the person around what happens to the animals later? Often we see a short clip of this animal's life and don't necessarily get that further detail. So now that you're aware, the next question, the next big thing we ask is that you do not watch the content. And obviously this can be quite difficult if nowadays things play automatically 
And you might want to, you might be watching the first few seconds to try to gauge what this is. But we want to stop watching that as soon as you realize what it is, because we don't want to be adding to the views that that video has had. And usually it is after so many seconds into the video that that will be classed as a view. And the reason why this is important, it also leads into our points three and four around do not engage, do not share. And this includes commenting, liking or disliking the videos. And I want you to think about how social media works. It's all about sharing the most popular content. So if a piece of content has had loads of engagement, the algorithms see that as popular content and they're going to push that further. Unfortunately, the algorithm doesn't see the difference between a negative interaction and a positive interaction. So a thumbs down or angry face emoji versus a love heart or a thumbs up or your comments that may be saying this isn't right, this is animal cruelty. All of that feeds into engagement and unfortunately is promoting the content. And I just wanted to share quickly here a page that's unfortunately available now on Facebook that I've been on recently. And there was many, many videos. This page is uploading about 10 videos a day showing their primates that they're keeping captive as pets. And when I looked at the comments, the vast majority of them, unfortunately, were from people like ourselves trying to raise awareness, trying to say that this isn't OK. But in reality, that is a great deal of interaction that we're giving to these pages who are pumping this content out and to really hit home this um, impact we have this rather funky looking diagram of all those engagements being funneled into the algorithm which is leading to more engagement more promotion of this content which unfortunately can be even leading to that content creator that animal abuser making more and more of this content to then start this cycle all over again so what you should do instead is to report the content to the platforms. And so I've got a quick question now around, have anyone, any of you ever reported animal cruelty content to a social media platform? I'd be really interested to see. So on Zoom, most people have reported content from what I can tell. And, you know, I'm really pleased to hear that because that is what we advocate for people to do. Some people, when they have reported the content, they do feel frustrated because they might not get the result they want straight away. They might not see the content being removed. But what we know is that it is really important thing to do. We looked at all of the links that we were collecting and, and reporting to the platform, and we found that around 47% of the links were eventually removed, which isn't good enough, it should be all of them, but it is far better than we thought. And what we think is going on here is that just because you've reported it and had a, not had the result you want, it doesn't mean that you haven't had an impact or that your report hasn't counted, because sometimes it can take multiple reports, sometimes it takes time, days, weeks, months before that content is removed. All of this we're trying to improve and make it happen quicker and faster, but it is really helpful in the process. And we know when we talk to the platforms, they do look at the types of content that is being reported to them. So we really need to make sure that they can see that animal content is a priority for people. And to make things easier for you, we've produced a series of videos on our website, which give you step by step instructions of how to report on some of the major platforms. You can also report the content direct to us. We have a really helpful, easy form on our website where you can just paste the link. And that will be fed into our database, which is where we use this data alongside all of the great data that our volunteers are collecting for us in our reports, in our conversations with the platforms. And if you want to get involved even more than that, you could become a SMAC volunteer. We probably have some of our volunteers on the call today. I can't remember if I've already asked you to, to say hi, but go ahead if you are. And also Lauren, my colleague that I mentioned earlier, she is the one that manages our volunteers. If you want to say hi, Lauren, in the chat. And if you really are interested in volunteering, what that could look like, you can email Lauren on smack2 at asiaforanimals.com. It really is, it's, it's hard because you are looking at animal cruelty content, but we really try to do our best to take care of you and you can do it in your free time in a way that suits you. 
For all of the things I've gone through today and we've mentioned today, you can find them on our website at forward slash public advice. And I want to say thank you for listening to all of our great speakers and thanking our speakers before we head into questions. So I believe that we have collected some of the questions and if anyone else has any more, you can just pop those in the chat. So I will bring all of our speakers back so that we can see everyone and they can answer. Okay, we've got everyone back. I'm going to put these questions out generally and we can see who'd be best place to answer them. So Giles from Taiwan SPCA has actually asked, when we mention wild animals as pets, does this include birds, rodents, turtles, etc.? Um, Jackie, do you want to answer that one? Sure, it certainly does. And we do highlight this in that spotlight report. There are many cases of parrots in the pet trade, for example, and reptiles. And when you um, read about that, you can see the horrible conditions under which they are transported in the illegal trade and how ill suited they are as pets in homes. Thank you. Um, our next question, um, which is to me actually, <laughs> Um, is Rima on Zoom who said, I've seen this so many times and I have had friends send them to me and say such sweet things like, this is lovely, this is cute. What's the best way to inform friends of these issues and where can I link my friends to for accurate information? So I would say that the resources that we've talked today are really good. We also have short videos on our social media pages that can go into a bit more detail around the different types of cruelty content so when we launched our teasing as torture report we had content for that um and I guess you know we try to make it informative but also in a format that people can easily take in which is basically social media con content we have more detail on our websites but that's probably a good place to start because it's digestible it's being given to them in small amounts and it hits those key messages straight away. So I would suggest that. I don't know if anyone else on our panel has suggestions for good resources. Hopefully all of them are smack because we are trying our best, but anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, I would just say in addition to the smack videos that you could send out, um, Born Free in um, one of the reports I covered in my presentation, um, we actually have a template that you could literally just copy and paste that um, says respectfully, um, thank you for sending this to me, but as a concerned animal lover, I just want to share these facts with you about why this is cruel content and what you can do about it. Um, so we literally have it all written up. Um, so, uh, I can share that link, um, <coughs> via email if you're interested, but yeah, it, it makes it easy, um, for you to just send that to whoever, whoever sends you concerning messages. Fantastic. That's a great resource. I was aware of that, but I hadn't thought of it. Thank you, Devin. If you wouldn't, if you could maybe pop the link in now whilst we're just doing the questions so people can find their way, is that possible? That would be brilliant. Okay, so we've had another question. Um, this was during Emily's talk. What about celebrities buying wildlife as pets and claiming it's a rescue to the public? Do you see celebrities making the issue worse? And what can we do to inform celebrities that this is wrong? This might be open to everybody. Um, so for something like that, I think that fall, kind of falls under wild animals as pets, but um, just like if you if you see, if, if I guess celebrities, like just informing people who see them or bring it up, like it's all about educating people. So I would think just who, who brings it up and whoever, if, you're, if you see it post on social media, like inform people talking about it that no, this is actually not okay. Um, I think educating people is the best thing that we can do. But Jackie, you might have more to comment on that as well. 
Well, not, not really much more to add. You know, again, we don't want to engage too much in these posts, uh, whether it be a celebrity or another private pet owner, but they are, um, you know, the, as we discussed in the presentation, they're part of the problem. They're part of that vicious cycle. And so I think educating people who might be impressed and say, oh, isn't that wonderful to, to kind of gently explain why it's not wonderful and it's not cute. Yeah. And the best scenario would be that we could reach out to these celebrities. And in fact, they realize the issue and we could even ask them whether they'd be willing to talk about, you know, the fact that they didn't know and that they have contributed. But, you know, if they're animal lovers, maybe they'd be likely to do that. And, and maybe that's something that we could try. It is unfortunate because everyone, most people do follow celebrities and are influenced by them. So it is really unhelpful when we see that happen. But yeah, I agree. We, if we consistent with our messaging that this is not okay, that's what we can do as animal advocates. Thank you. This may be a question for Devon. We've had Pam on Zoom asking, is anything happening in the USA to stop the posting of animal torture videos? There are so many viewers in the US. Yeah, there are, um, unfortunately. And in our report, we found that indeed a lot of the accounts were based within the US um, that were posting most of the cruelty content that we were seeing in our data collection. Um, so uh, we have joined SMAC and that I think is very helpful in setting a model for us to um, sort of have a really good way to approach how to deal with these things uh, within the US. Um, but the main thing that Born Free does currently work for is the campaigning and the lobbying aspect for legislation that will um, effectively ban the ownership of these wild animals that are suffering um, just outright. So that would kind of help mitigate that root cause. Um, but until then, we are distributing our reports and um, you know, trying to raise awareness as much as possible about what people can do and what the average social media user can do in the meantime before the platforms are able to make the adjustments that are required. Thank you, Devin. Um, another question is, what is, where is the line between torture and suffering and fun? So I'll open this up to everybody if they want to respond. It's a tough one, maybe. So I guess, you know, some people might say, well, you know, I have a dog and I dress him up sometimes and put content online. Is that bad? Should I be doing that? What do we think? I suppose. Oh, carry no, on, I'm just going to say this for domesticated species, there's probably a difference of opinion on that. But since mm -hmm. we're talking about the difference between domesticated and wild, I think any time you have a wild animal in a, a home situation, it, you can argue that that line has been crossed, that it's not fun anymore. It's, we know that it's a situation where the animal's needs aren't being met and the animal's suffering. Yes, thank you. I think that is important, particularly when we know that so much of the animals in the content are wild animals as well. We have a question around reporting. <laughs> Lots of people on YouTube saying they report every day but feel it's not enough sometimes. And again, we completely share that frustration. Like I say, we are seeing some improvements. We believe in response from the platforms, but it isn't good enough. It is really slow. We know that there's lots of problems with the process, but it is the best tool that we have at the moment. And when we're talking with the platforms, we are referring to that. And we keep saying that this is what we're doing. This is what you tell people that they should do. And it's not always working. So it's really key that that continues so that in our conversations, we can push for them to be better. And this is where all of those points come in earlier about us working with improving their policy, potentially providing training around how they can identify cruelty. Because many of them say to us, oh, well, some of this content is gray area. Like we don't see 
the cruelty because again they're thinking of that physical violence and not the for example a lot of the primate content where they're being kept as pets on face value they're not necessarily seeing the cr inherent cruelty there so we're working with them on that to improve their knowledge on that in the hope that they will then start to do more to see that content removed or restricted that we please 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 report the content even if it feels fruit fruit fruitless and you're not getting what you want we know that it is important part of convincing the platforms okay i've had a question um does smack have a dialogue with telegram they allow monkey abuse channels with horrific content and seldom removes them no matter how many times one emails complaints we don't at the moment. We have reached out to them, and that is something that we're focusing on. But it's, you know, it is hard, and we have to just keep going. And again, we are approaching them as SMAC. We're using our strength as a coalition to have all of these organizations behind us, but we're really at the beginnings of that engagement with the platform at the moment. So we need to show that there are those people who are users who are reporting this content. Again, I'm going to keep saying the same thing but at this stage in in the work it's really important we do intend to look beyond telegram as well there are other platforms that we want to work with you know it's not just these big names that we've talked about we want to actually map out the key social media platforms ideally around the world and um work with more of them because of course they all feed into each other people jump from platform to platform. So we have to do it in that approach as well. Okay, just checking. Uh, Myrto has asked us, do you have any examples of how you raise public awareness through what channels and what is the feedback? So I'll open this up to our speakers, please. Who wants to go first? Connie? Um, yeah, well, with us, we, we do weekly um, inspector blogs. So we, we kind of share um, cases that we're dealing with, um, mainly to educate the public. And um, I think the feedback's been good. You know, people, a lot of people, we find that um, they don't exactly know about these things that's going on. Um, a lot of times we find that people don't deliberately um, abuse animals. Um, they're just not educated about animal welfare. Um, so yeah, we try to do educational, um, posts, um, and we, do, we go to schools, we do a lot of, um, educational, uh, talks. So yeah, I think it's pretty effective. Yeah. Great. Emily? Yeah, um, at Lady Freethinker, we publish like a lot of petitions to educate the public about things going on. So um, we have several petitions asking different social media platforms to remove um, cruel content and educating people like about it. And then we send those out in newsletters to all of our like members. Um, we post on so we post on social media to educate people. And um, we also like work to publish reports. We work with SMAC. Um, on a report and also a different one earlier this year um, to try and educate the public as well. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we have run over time a little bit. Um, so I haven't been able to get to all of the questions, but I think we'll wrap it up there. So again, a huge, huge thank you to all of our speakers for giving your time. You are all amazing SMAC members and we have many other members that couldn't be with us today, but we hope we can bring them forward in future webinars. It's been really interesting. I've enjoyed listening to everyone speak. I hope that everyone joining us on Zoom and YouTube has also really enjoyed this. The recording will be on YouTube to watch in future. So if you want to share it with your friends, you can do that to help spread more awareness. We do have a report, uh, feedback form, sorry that we would love our participants to complete to help us improve how we do things going forward and make sure that it's enjoyable for you. So we'll just pop the link to that in the chat. I'm a bit behind on the chat, so maybe that's already in there, but 
Um, can someone in the team pop the um, feedback form? It's already in there. Okay, it's already in there. Sorry. Brilliant. Everyone's really on it. And so if you could complete that, we'll also send out an email to remind you. But if you could just spend a couple of minutes to do that now, that would be really fantastic. I also want to say thank you to all of my colleagues in the background helping this run smoothly. And hopefully you've got all of our links that we've been sharing. We'll put them under the YouTube video as well for you to find. And please do watch out for future events by Asia for Animals that we have coming up. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.